Hi and welcome to the first uh, universal diet and we are in a, an installation by Jonas Stahl which is an attempt to appropriate which is an attempt to appropriate and um, the Polish Parliament and um, and I and desecrate the uh, Polish Parliament and I suppose I suggest we desecrate it again and appropriate it again. Uh, some of you have done so already because after uh, yesterday's uh, session, I uh, realized that not I noticed that not all of us are structured enough and not all of us are robust enough kind of to sit without uh, resting our back uh, so it's worth us uh, moving down a notch down a level like the ladies here and at least you'll be able to uh, have a prop have something to support your back I thought that we'd have uh, that we'd have a, a capacity audience and that we wouldn't fit, but uh, not everyone's uh, shown up. However, this is still the same, the Polish Parliament, and what's uh, happening here between us, what's uh, moving between us, are. Uh, maybe trickles of fascism, something that inconspicuously these uh, little threads that seep into our bodies uh, every day in school, at work, and and they mm, place us in our shells. So why feminism, not fascism? Because culturally speaking, uh, what is feminine is identified with the fluid, the um, unpredictable, with uncontrolled desire. And that's what fascists are scared of. And that's what we'll be talking about today. <coughs> uh, together with Magda Gavin, who's a teacher at the uh, Social Sociotherapy uh, Center, who's right there. Magda, if you could raise your hand. Honorata Sadurska, who's uh, sitting right here. She's an activist. Uh, she is an activist and the co-organizer of the Equality March in Lublin. Uh, we have a Professor Małgorzata Fushara, who's a sociologist and lawyer. And Piotr Laskowski, who is a teacher, an academic teacher. Uh, who, and also teaches at the multicultural uh, uh, secondary school, the Jacek Kuroń Multicultural uh, Secondary School. I'm sure um, our guests, our speakers, have wear very many other hats, but maybe that's not that relevant for the purposes of our discussion. And it's not academic titles that uh, matter here. It's not um, alphabet soup uh, after your name, but I want everyone, I would like everyone to take part in the discussion. Let's have an experiment. Let's try and see how much of fascism is within each and every one of us. I'm sure this may have been done uh, in uh, various uh, deba debates um, and in, in the wake of the publishing of the book Male Fantasies. Uh, this is still topical in Poland, so it really won't hurt, even though the Polish model of masculinity, which we'll be saying a lot about today, is a little different different, is a bit different uh, from what uh, Tevelites uh, described, but uh, there's a lot in common. It does have a lot of common features, so the toolkit 
uh, will still be necessary, useful. And now it's over to Sebastian, and I think we can begin. Uh, briefly, I wanted to say, first of all, hi, and uh, second, um, I'll be referring to, I'll be um, referring to a couple of texts uh, that I'll just uh, mention. If um, we manage, I'll try and uh, send these uh, quotes uh, to your email addresses. Uh, some of you have uh, signed up with your email address. So, but if anybody objects to uh, having these uh, quotes uh, sent to them under the General Data Protection Directive or something else, or if you want to obtain these uh, quotes in some other uh, way, then I'm sure something can be done. Does anybody have a problem with uh, getting a mail, an email from me? Okay, then I'll just uh, shoot you an email. And if anybody has uh, questions uh, during the session, please feel free to uh, intervene. And and, but uh, at the end, we'll have about 40 minutes uh, for discussion, during which I'd like all of you to maybe share examples, to maybe give us uh, some case studies or examples on uh, micro-fascism, <coughs> micro-aggressions that you've encountered in your everyday life. And I'm wondering how to um, talk about how to um, uh, what to say about fascism in the uh, few minutes I have, maybe to order some things, maybe to uh, repeat uh, some of the things that were said yesterday. I suppose I can uh, say that, um, like uh, the uh, participants of uh, yesterday's uh, session, that uh, fascism is uh, slippery, it's difficult to describe, it's a hybrid language, but it's at the same um, at the same time, it's, uh, we have some kind of intuition. We know we can tell what fascism is. So I decided I'd uh, come up with, I'd give you three and a half uh, examples of how fascism was understood after fascism, after World War II, how different thinkers understood it. and. Um, and how thinkers who tried to alert or call attention, uh, fascists, uh, uh, thinkers uh, who fall in line with the genealogy of fascism. I think we want to have an image of fascism. Fascism is tangible aesthetically, it's um, visible in a way. So by way of uh, explanation, this micro-fascism that we're talking about, that we will be talking about, uh, that we described in the um, agenda, uh, we took this from Deleuze and Guattari's book, and uh, that's, the quote, that's a quote from that book I'll be um, sending you. Generally, it's um, fascism that's not a political doctrine, it's a way of life. It's uh, fascism that's within uh, all of us, that determines, that shapes all of us. So how did it get there? Is it within us uh, truly? And what is it all about? And um, so it, to think, to realize that uh, a right-wing and a left-wing person can be a uh, fascist and identifying fascism is on the one hand very simple, but it's also very difficult. And between before we uh, begin fighting fascism, a big, uh, great fascism, macro-fascism, uh, as represented by nationalist organizations, we need to take a look at not streams, but these uh, trickles, these uh, trickles and these uh, trickles of uh, fascism is a concept that Wukash Yaskowa coined. So the first thing that I think uh, requires uh, explanation, because this comes up in public debate, is the belief, the conviction that fascism in a way grows out of is a product of liberal economy, meaning it's often said that Hochheimer said that if you don't want to talk about capitalism, you should be silent about capitalism. A lot of uh, people say that he didn't say it, uh, but I th did manage to track down that quote. Hochheimer wrote that on the eve of the war in an essay, The Jews in Europe, in 1939. 
and this uh, neoliberal logic of free competition um, produces fascism in that liberalism um, supports uh, competition rather than free competition and it's a um, means and not an end and as in every competition the end is a monopoly so winning dominating uh, with the strongest uh, thought the strongest attitude the strongest position and belief the strongest prevails and that comes out victorious and so this seems banal but it's also important when we think about how in our thinking of this minor lesser fascism everyday fascism and to make it more um, sensual a more sensual metaphor is uh, taken genealogically early uh, 17th century pascal had these two uh, little infinities that i wanted to uh, refer to so we have uh, blaise pascal looking up at the sky through a telescope and sees things that can't be seen with the uh, naked eye and that uh, terrifies him that puts him in awe so it's something it's an infinity that he doesn't see and it is uh, infinite because we never know what's beyond and it's also uh, the other way in the micro scale if you look at your skin with an implement you'll see uh, little uh, dragons or animals you'll see mites and uh, so microbes so the multiplicity of the world the uh, abundance that we have in the world the uh, kingdoms the animal kingdoms that's uh, kind of terrifying and it's fear of the uh, diversity and um, multiplicity of the world the, and there's also an interview in Newsweek with uh, Wagner's great grandson who'd written a uh, book about Wagner uh, it says uh, how it was about how Wagner inspired the Nazis and how uh, his um, work uh, incorporates uh, oppression, misogyny, and anti-Semitism. This is the uh, Rheingold. Rheingold, uh, the uh, first uh, part of the uh, Nibelungen lead of the uh, tetralogy. So we have a dwarf, Falberic, uh, who's not liked by anyone. And at the bottom of the Rhine River, there's uh, a hoard of gold. And if you uh, get it, you'll rule the world. It's uh, guarded by the daughters of the Rhine, the Rhine maidens. And uh, the dwarf, Falberic, uh, does this. Uh, nobody likes him. Uh, so he steals the gold of the Rhine. He uh, knows that he will rule the world and he renounces uh, love so this uh, turning your back on life and love with this uh, urge for death this uh, craving uh, this death wish in a way but again this doesn't exhaust the uh, topic this doesn't uh, cover all the bases but it does give you an idea of uh, what it looks like Magda Gavin now I promised to uh, share my experience uh, as a teacher as a teacher, I wanted to say how young women and young men uh, who are secondary school students, how they respond to something born out of myth. Uh, how they respond to uh, Me Too, hashtag Me Too, and the uh, Polish uh, black uh, protest. Uh, so we have trickles of uh, fascism, but we can also speak about pebbles of uh, feminism and uh, in, uh, opposition to uh, attempts at uh, further limiting abortion rights was um, very commonplace among women and men, but the response was uh, surprising because women uh, began uh, revolting, they began organizing and putting up resistance and it's not all of them not all but some of them did read the texts uh, about the topic but they also uh, realized that it was not about that what was at stake was not control of reproductive rights but what was at stake was a control over sexuality and their revolt their objection was an expression on the discovery of their own sexuality i remember one meeting i remember a class we had that i decided to uh, uh, talk about freedom and that was a spark that um, led to an explosion among these 
young women, uh, which I feel was uh, symptomatic. So they didn't answer my question. They didn't say they wanted the right to choose uh, what to do with their bodies. So they went, they took it further. They literally climbed up on the table and started uh, yelling, saying that freedom, that for them, freedom meant the right to uh, have sex with anybody they wanted and wherever they wanted and it's nobody's business uh, so their response uh, was uh, to uh, affirm their own sexuality and their right to have um, a sexual dimension to have a sex life and the second thing they uh, second thing that was uh, more difficult a second thing that was a response to the me too movement it was more difficult because it uh, sensitized women. Women became aware of uh, the silent appropriation of a space. So there's the question of mansplaining. They weren't aware of the word. It wasn't a word they knew, but they soon uh, became aware. They became woke to uh, uh, mansplaining and everything it means. So they began, um, they the, it was an agonistic situation. We um, had uh, informal communiques and the messages that um, where these young women were um, subordinated and uh, the things that young women were subjected to and they agreed to and they began opposing and objecting to that. So this created an agnostic uh, space it, uh, there was a very conflict there was a conflict between the genders and uh, as w with the development of uh, the me too movement as the movement uh, progressed uh, these young women began um, talking about their traumatic uh, oppressive experience uh, their own and um, their peers uh, experience where they were uh, the victims of abuse or practically rape, even rape, uh, explicitly rape. And uh, what was typical was that uh, they didn't feel embarrassed, they didn't feel ashamed talking about it, they didn't want to uh, talk about it privately, but they uh, uh, spoke about it in class, in the classroom. They um, uh, talked about things that were to illustrate, uh, provide examples of the violence that they had encountered. And this uh, led to a further um, revolt and further agonistic situations where uh, boys, young men, um, kind of responded with aggression. Aggression that in turn uh, made them want to uh, put these young women in their place to subjugate them and since it was in a classroom uh, the teacher uh, can't be just a bystander the uh, this also creates a very difficult uh, it's, a, it's a tough decision it's a tough choice because teachers are expected to look after the order and the question is what kind of order do we want so if I um, kind of put them all into their place, if I uh, tell the young women to stop uh, shouting, to stop being so upset, will I be speaking in favor of order or will I let or do I let these young women to rearrange this order? And that was uh, really very powerful. And what was typical was uh, the times when women were in the minority. What was mm, incredible was that they were cooperating, they were acting together. So they started, uh, they took up the fight and um, the young men also uh, joined in the fray or and uh, they but the young women wouldn't back down. So they began um, sticking to their guns they began a uh, very much uh, they began um, talking as they began saying uh, what was on their minds and uh, when so they when they wanted to be nasty to their uh, school friends to the boys the young men they began talking about uh, their periods began talking about menstruation began saying what they want in sex so they began um, they were empowered they were uh, subjects uh, who were uh, sexual beings and uh, individuals who wanted to take that position, that specific position, not uh, 
somebody who has the right to uh, speak their mind and somebody who's who and whose bodies who's in persons uh, are treated in such a way they're being uh, oppressed by being desexualized so one of the aspects i'll make it in time don't worry one of the aspects one of, mm, of the one of, uh, part of this and we had a lot of uh, cases of um, sexual abuse were brought to our uh, attention but the flip side is that women are treated as passive here uh, passive in that you can uh, abuse their confidence, abuse their trust, but women are also uh, victims. They're placed in the position of victims and they don't have individual desires or fantasies. And uh, what was incredible here was that they spoke, these young women spoke about everything. So it wasn't just uh, that they objected to uh, various types of behavior, but they also expressed their sexuality. They uh, manifested themselves uh, in uh, different ways. And uh, so what they wanted from me was a very radical change uh, in the economy of visibility in that. In the entire situation, the agonistic uh, situation, antagonistic situation, they wanted me to uh, uh, buttress them, to, 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 to reinforce them, to provide reinforcement by talking to them. And I tried to do that. So I asked uh, young men who were, um, who weren't, uh, I asked them to leave the room, or at least I asked them not to take part in the discussion if they weren't able to recognize, appreciate young women as individuals. And uh, they also expected me to, they expected me to be sensitive. They expected me to realize who I was looking at, uh, who, who, who I was talking to. And uh, it's, I'm not sure whether young men uh, drew the right conclusions, one last thing. But what is optimistic, it's a question of conflict. And it's this conflict can't be processed or worked through in a, such a way as to uh, stabilize, as to leave the agonistic situation and uh, recreate and find another uh, rearranged uh, uh, space of dialogue um, of, uh, and I, so I'm not sure that all of these young men understood what had taken place but on an optimistic an optimistic little pebble kind of um, uh, building block uh, the next uh, generation or the young men who are just uh, starting school are very interested in what rape is so they're interested in what rape is meaning they want someone to uh, tell them specifically what it means to give them a specific definition so they expected somebody to go through to go over the entire situation what the consent means and so on they want specifics uh, rather than uh, vague generalities uh, so violation but what does it mean uh, not to overstep a line if you're at a party for instance and one last thing i they also were talking about uh, realizing I recently had a class with them where realizing, uh, becoming aware that space, that a party situation can be a space, a situation that can be oppressive because it's uh, a hunting ground. And, uh, and so there's a task, uh, there's a uh, so it's take responsibility uh, to have this, uh, to make this a space of affirmation and not a hunting ground to avoid predatory behavior. And um, I mean, obviously, I haven't. I mean, I haven't done research, uh, but these are just examples uh, from my own backyard that uh, might be um, optimistic. So thank you very much. And. Uh, the, if you'll be given us, if you'll want to give examples like that, uh, please come forward uh, later on. Together, we'll try and analyze them. Uh, we'll and now Professor Maugrojata Fushara, uh, whom I wanted to ask uh, to comment to say why it is that young men uh, have this uh, response or respond the way they do. Why do they get upset uh, when they encounter liberated feminine sexuality? Well, of course, that's the way to overpower women. There is absolutely no doubt about it. 
and it's a manifestation of power and actually slipping, slipping of the hands of various institutions, the church, the school, men. Yes, we can see on the one hand it's a bit of an optimism, on the other hand it's a bit of a pessimism. Why pessimism? Well, let's remember the famous slogan, we want the whole life. That's what Naukowska said in early 20th century at one of the women's rallies, and that did include the aspect of sexuality. It was a huge scandal. Naukowska, her friends had to leave the room. Uh, it was very controversial, but the history repeats itself. Women had been demanding freedom on many different platforms, but I don't have any socio sociological findings to prove what you mentioned, how many schools, how many debates are held. But going back to what you said, Madam, I was quite um, interested in what you said about the need for a definition. Definitions which I suppose used to be quite self-evident or self-explanatory definition of rape. Yes, it has changed. Let's say it out loud. Legally, it has not been amended yet, but it's gaining new meaning now. But I can recall when we had the Me Too campaign, a journalist approached me, a very open-minded journalist. He wanted to ask me, he said, he, he gave me some examples, he said, but Madam, Professor, is this harassment or is it not harassment? And I said, Sir, this is a rudeness, okay, for sure. You don't have to think whether it's harassment if you hit someone, you push someone, you offend someone. If someone acts like a pig, it should be clear to everyone that things like that must not be condoned. Why do I say that in this room? Well, talking about sexual harassment, the US standards, when you say that if you don't want someone to act like that vis-a-vis -vis your daughter, mother, wife, don't do it yourself. That is the simplest uh, guidance. I have some examples to uh, share with you as well. It's appropriation of space. It's ever important. Appropriation of space is one of the um, ways to overpower other people. It's one of the manifestations of gender inequality. There's a lot of research what happens in the classroom, how female and male teachers address boys versus how they address girls. That's also my experience personally. In 1990s, at the beginning with Professor Elena Razielinska, we introduced a subject on equality between women and men in the law and in the socio-economic reality. It was a revolution. We invited law students and social sciences students, applied social sciences. It was fascinating because when you try to generalize, it always comes back to my mind because you could judge by the context of their um, interventions, you could guess who studied what and why. So it was a big group, more women than men, but men tried to dominate in terms of time. They wanted to speak all the time. They were against equality. They were asking, but madam, what's it really like? Why do you say it's a sign of inequality? Why do you believe that? And at long last, it was really hard for us, you know, us being the professors, it was hard to overcome that because it was like totally overpowering, taking over the whole time, etc. But then the girls got upset and they said, shush, shush, let these professors um, continue and don't interrupt, stop it. So you have to have the amen corner, some kind of allies, whatever position you have, having an amen corner, it's a key thing. When you're, someone tries to dominate over you to take over the time or to introduce any uh, aspect of inequality, you have to speak up, protest, tell them that's not the way you should behave, don't do it. Moving on, you mentioned the ladies, the girls who spoke about her personal experience. Uh, the power also manifests itself in being silent or excluding certain problems, excluding them from the debate. And it often manifests itself how we treat girls when you read looks, various dimensions of power. There's extortion, and then there's the other dimension of 
excluding people or topics from the debate. The motto for a debate is to be inclusive, the inclusivity. And there was an example how this excluded people come back and fight back for the space. The narration of the excluded, once they learned that this just can't be that way, that's ever important, because the change can only start if the narration of the excluded comes up to the surface. When one group of people dominates the debate and the other group who is affected by those practices and who is treated inequally, they will not be able to make a change, make a difference, unless the narration is given the voice. So I'm delighted that the girls were not inhibited, they were not intimidated. At the very beginning of the black protest, the politicians, do you remember they were trying to apply the old narration of preaching to women, disciplining women. Some MPs said, what can this woman say? My womb, my business. A woman would never say that. It only happened once or twice. And these fantastic poems, they were um, shouting out loud in front of law and justice office. These young women, they were shouting. It was great. They gave a lesson to the politicians. You cannot not do it anymore. The world has changed. It's a new era, a new world. But I don't want to see things with rose-colored spectacles. I agree that for this generation of women, it was. I hope it was a formative experience. They entered the streets. They spoke on their own behalf. They shouted out loud, and they put, a, put the changes to a halt. I don't know for how long, but for now, these changes have been stopped. But what am I really worried about? I'm worried about some inequalities because in 1990s there was an article in Gazeta Wyborcza Daily by Dominika Wielowiewska, the reporter. She was trying to discipline the feminists a little bit. And there was, there was a series of articles that Gazeta Wyborcza, in reply to that, oh, bless Gazeta Wyborcza, they published our voices. And I wrote about inequality on the labor market and the discrepancies in the wages. And then a reporter from Gazeta Wyborcza called me and he asked, Madam, how do you know there are inequalities in wages? How do you know that? And I said, sir, statistical yearbook, just look your, at your yearbook. And for many years, such data has been published. You would have to be blind not to see that. This data is widely available. But that was a revolution. They published that. They added a chart, a table on wage inequality. Today, everybody knows that there is wage inequality in Poland. And everybody can even uh, name the magnitude of that inequality. Everybody knows the women are abused. But this knowledge doesn't turn to a scandal. It's becoming a part of ordinary lives. We say, yeah, women do the house work, women less, uh, earn less, that's obvious. Some husbands beat their wives to a pulp. So we have to look for the pebbles to make a difference and to change the world. I hope the revolution is on our doorstep, but let's talk about it later, because I've already exceeded my time allotment. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Let me give the floor to Hodorata Sadurska. She fights against fascism in Lubin inter alia, and then we'll go back to the analytical part. Wait a second, please. Yeah, if I may, I know that I can guess it's probably just a language cliche, cliche but I don't think we should say that somebody acts like a pig when you talk about harassment. I mean, uh, animals, Let, we shouldn't, yes, I apologize. We shouldn't, yes, I offend an animal, yes, exactly. Thank you. When someone tells me that in Poland there is no fascism and there is no issue with fascism in Poland, I always tell them, why don't you look at the footage from Equality March in Lublin? It was something out of ordinary in a very negative way. As you know, the top sets the tone. And in Lublin, from the very start, we had a problem because the authorities made it very clear how much they did not want to have the march. 
and how much they were against our activism. Forget the political tension that was how we much were pressed about the date. I'm leaving it aside. But it all started with the city councillors from Lauren Justice. They called our march the promotion of pedophilia. Then the Voivode, the regional governor, said we should not promote um, things that are unnatural. Then there was an idea to call up uh, an extraordinary session of city council to forbid, to prohibit the march. It was totally absurd. The city councillors would never have the right to prohibit the march. But with everything they did, they were giving um, telling the ordinary citizens, hey, you can show hatred, you can tell them you're against. There were posters all over the streets. No, for the homosexual march, keep Lublin free from deviation. Even forget this um, little signs that homosexuality is out. One of our activists met, came across a leader of uh, Lublin nationalists and on the bus um, he was actually threatened. Another activist, a girl, they scared her so much that she gave up and she didn't want to continue helping us organize the march. What else? Um, well, the climax of all these was the prohibition that the city mayor Krzysztof Żuk, he issued a prohibition for the march. When he spoke about it, he said that the march is a risk for human life and health, life and health of the residents. He also prohibited this counter parade, but, well, we weren't happy about it because he said he doesn't uh, support any of the parties. So what does it mean? It means our march is prohibited and on top of that our peaceful parade for equal rights, it was put at par with a hateful manifestation of, well, let's call it fascist power, regrettably. And that's when we went to court. I think this battle was in the news all over the country. First, the regional court upheld the mayor's prohibition that the Court of Appeal ruled against that. And at the end of the day, we could have our legal march. We loved it. We were on top of the world. But once again, it was not all that rosy. I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the first march ever since 2005 that stirred up so much aggression. The nationalist movement, they had three objectives. On the October 13th, when the march took place, their objectives were as follows. First, to intimidate us, to demonstrate their power. There were rockets, there were slogans, they had crude um, songs and shouting. It was like this male, macho power manifesting itself. On top of that, they wanted to block us physically, to prevent us from walking. The police had to change the route. They had to use, what do they call it, some physical persuasion, namely water, cannons and the tear gas. And the third objective of these lovely activists was to hurt us. They wanted to hurt us. Since the police was the buffer zone, they were throwing objects at us. Eggs, tomatoes, rockets and stones. And those who were really creative, they took the slabs, pavement slabs, and even the chairs from beer gardens. So, Simply speaking, we were scared, we were frightened about you know, our health, our lives. We were happy to march on. We were happy to demonstrate and kind of prove it that there is an LGBTQ and a um, community in Lublin. But when you see those uh, missiles thrown at you and you pray, God, make, make it a tomato, not a stone, that obviously shows that the city has a problem, has a problem with hatred has a problem with the clearly 
you know, problem with tolerance. I hate that word, by the way, I prefer acceptance. And I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, the politicians, had, if they had used totally different rhetoric, if they hadn't gone that way, then perhaps, just perhaps, the events from October 13th in Lublin would have been much less extreme. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Piotr, by the way, I've just, it occurred to me, I have a question to ask of you. What's it really like? Honorata uses this term, this macho masculinity, excuse me, macho power. What does the fascism have in common with toxic masculinity? And why? Why is, was the clash so symptomatic? I mean, this colorful, joyful parade clashed against a hateful and aggressive and hostile demonstration. Well, a brief answer is that it, it has everything in common, but it's really hard to be theoretic now after what we heard from Honorata. I mean, please, this is very carnal, very material, and it speaks more, louder. I don't want to throw words at it, okay? But before I take your question, let me mention what Anna Zawadzka wrote on a different occasion, but it does correspond to what Honorata said. And it kind of enhances it. Well, it's one of the four words for the Holy War albums about graffiti, about Wojciech Wilczek. So what Anna Zawadzka wrote in that preface was that the authors of graffiti, and we know it's homophobic, anti-Semitic, misogynic, and in general, it meets all the criteria to be classified as fascist. Well, these authors, they deserve a high five for participation in culture. So in that sense, you're absolutely right what the politicians have been doing, this political discourse. It is very meaningful, but it actually goes deeper. I'm, I'm trying to say that our culture is oriented in that way. And what they do is they actually implement this cultural ideal of the cursed soldiers who march to fight for Poland, for purity, for what else? The truth. In other words, they correspond beautifully to this general paradigm in schools and on the media and in our culture. They really um, embody this model of masculinity, even if they aren't aware of that. But they hear about this model at school and they just soak it in, they absorb it. And what does this paradigm include? It includes power and praise for power, praise the strength. There is necrophilia, very strong necrophilic streak. This ability, well, we worship graves. So grave worship, I know it's, we say it over and over again, but let me repeat after Professor Fushara. We talk about it, it's becoming part of the life as we know it, our normal scheme of things. A liberal party commemorates cursed soldiers who are fascists. Now they are supposed to be worshipped commonly. The prime minister of the country, not from the liberal uh, fraction, yes, but he actually puts a flower wreath or the grave of an army that collaborated with Nazis. It's unthinkable scandal, and yet it's no scandal. You just nod your head, shake your head, well, that's what they are like, life is life, what can you do about it? So in that sense, these people, they are not really an extreme case. No, they are the most perfect embodiment of Polish culture as we know it as it has been defined, and there's a long, long explanation why it is the way it is. Well, and at the same time, and um, 
well, it seems complicated and, and challenging, but I have this intuition that in what they are doing, there is a, well, that in a sense, they are really deep in the culture and also they articulate their rebellion that they are unable to articulate in any other way. Going back to what Sebastian said, yes, if you want to talk about capitalism, you have to talk about fascism at the same time. If we all agree, if we all agree that the basic function of capitalism is alienation from the world, alienation of the reality, this emotion, a sense that the world is radically alien to me, and also I'm disintegrating, then the body, they have to be doing weightlifting, going to the gym, building their bodies, bodybuilding. That's all they have at the end of the day. This body full of muscles, and they have to protect the body from any kind of destruction, all this homophobic um, whims that they produced a bit, well, not a bit, they are fundamentally related to that. So I believe that is, um, well, that's the primary challenge we are faced with, this challenge of facing up to, to, to the fact that their alienation, I believe, their real, real fear real anxiety about the reality. That is how it is channeled. But we have failed. We have failed at doing that, okay? Before we met here, I read an article from 1992 by Karol Radek, who is one of the most tragic yet fascinating examples or embodiments of Polish, Russian, German communism. Radek, in 1922, he wrote an article about a German nationalist who was killed in Ruhr, and then he became a hero of Nazi movement. And the idea is, it's an appeal to German nationalists. Come on, join us, join us, we have an offer for you. So the text was interesting because it had a clear definition of what was at stake, and it was scary because of, of absolute lack of understanding, the fundamental error, fundamental failure, because Radek wrote about this necrophiliac vision. You can die for our cause. You don't have to die for your own cause. Come on, let's die for our cause. So it's a deep fallacy of that text. It's quite striking to me. Well, I know that I'm behind schedule. No, no, not so much, don't worry. And uh, now let's leave the Lublin march on the side for a moment. I have a comment about our marches in general. I feel a part of that marches, parades. Well, question is, what is at stake? What is the name of the game? It would be dangerous and risky to just be legit, try to be legitimate, to be rec recognized by the law, to have this government um, umbrella over us. Tactically, tactically I support this uh, stipulation of partnerships, gay marriages, etc. I don't want to move it to a strategic level. I'm very unhappy about the Polish hymn, which is sometimes uh, heard at this march for equality. I don't like it. I try to come later to avoid listening to the hymn, national anthem. Let's not try to assimilate with the majority. Let's not do it. It will have catastrophic consequences. First of pragmatic. We know it from experience, from other minority groups. If you try to use the discourse of the um, superior roommate, actually inferior roommate, the majority will remind you very quickly, hey, you're inferior. You're just a lesser person here. There's been a great book, Just Beer Poor. It's my final comment. The terrorist assemblage, homo nationalism. It's a category of homo nationalism. And that's what you read the, the price you pay today in the US for empowerment of LGBT plus. It's Islamophobia. That's the price we pay for it because we have to prove that we belong here. We belong with the society, a majority society. And now please 
embrace us because we are Islamophobic too. So it's a redefinition of culture from the very, very roots of the culture. That's the key thing. Thank you. Thank you. Before we start the discussion, what, what did you mean by this inferior roommate? Well, it's, it's a category that's used in Poland in so-called Polish-Jewish relationship studies. So what does it mean is that, well, the majority of the society will explain it to you. I mean, they can accept you as a minority, but only as a guest, as a visitor. It's their fixed approach to Jews in Poland. The Jews were the guests. Guests, 19th, 20th century, some visitors. It's an ab absurd as a concept. But if you adopt that concept, you will have to explain yourself over and over because I'm a guest. I mean, you have to be nice, kind, courteous, say yes to everything and show that I'm so delighted to enjoy your hospitality and I'm totally grateful for your hospitality. So that's what I meant to say. Let's stop it. But thank you for your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now it's time for our discussion. We have the uh, lecterns and uh, pulpits here, but we're not using them. We want this to be a conversation and not a lecture, and uh, we're trying to uh, change the uh, principles, uh, the rules of the game. We want to uh, gossip about fascism and not uh, pontificate about fascism. So if anybody has uh, comments or questions or anything else to uh, say, then like raise your hand and... If I may, I mean, before anybody asks for the floor and preparing for this um, meeting and uh, thinking about it for some time, I uh, realize that the uh, strategy of assimilation is uh, dangerous for minorities which, who are fighting for their dignity. Uh, but I don't know if this, if this is the right question. What uh, strategy ought to be chosen? And I don't really know who I'm addressing this uh, question to, but. I found this very problematic, what you said about assimilation. Rights give you a sense of, uh, give a sense of uh, safe security or safety to those who don't feel safe. Our rights uh, give a sense of safety to the LGBTQA plus community, and they're not uh, forced to be in monogamous relations or uh, marriage if they want to. They uh, ha they feel safe. They uh, can uh, visit their partners in hospital. That they can, if they have children together. I mean, they want this uh, sense of safety. They want the sense of uh, like integrity of their family, and that's not something I want to uh, give up, especially in a country like Poland, because the realm, the space of freedom. It's like uh, heterosexual uh, couples also have various different models of intimacy, different uh, ways of uh, monogamy, polygamy, they experiment, but uh, those people who need safety uh, take benefit from that or make use of that. So I wouldn't uh, uh, saw or cut this uh, branch uh, here. I wouldn't get, I fully, I mean, it's clear. Uh, that's why I said we need tactically to recognize this demand because it does change a lot and it changes a lot not just for people who select this type of relationship for all non-heteronormative people and introduction uh, recognition of these people into the law will change a lot even in school even if uh, non-heteronormative uh, people being uh, forced out of the school system, if the state recognizes these people, acknowledges their existence, then it has a topical, it has a, it definitely has a good impact. The problem is, and all I wanted to say is that that's not enough. We can't let it stop there. We can treat it tactically, but first of all, we can't uh, trust in the permanence of such a solution. We have a lot of experience of um, this type of recognition in the law uh, comes to an end when the majority says it should. So it's not something given once and for all. And second, you can't really be blind to a self-normatization that ensues, that uh, because it leads to a line of reasoning 
in that I find difficult to accept. So the line of reasoning is that basically we are like you. We want a house with a home, a house with a garden and a picket fence. I understand that there are people who want uh, houses, gardens, and picket fences, but uh, the minority position has a potential for radically redefining culture, and I think we can't lose sight of that. We can't uh, lose that only by saying that we want uh, such and such uh, rights and freedoms because culture is uh, fascism is uh, latent in uh, culture it uh, potentially present in culture it uh, comes to the fore uh, it manifests itself uh, more explicitly or less so but if we want to have the rights if we want to have equal status with the bourgeoisie then sooner or later we will have to either stand on the sides aside of the fascists uh, so we'll have to start hating islam hating the Muslims to uh, reaffirm ourselves as good white Europeans or we'll lose or we'll always be reminded that we don't entirely belong so we'll always be forced to reaffirm our belonging and I think that this trap this assimilationist uh, trap is real which doesn't change the fact and um, here I'm not an uncompromising radical. I'm not to. Um, so I think it's better that to have this uh, these laws uh, than not. But I, it's definitely the beginning of a process. It's the uh, first step, and not the uh, horizon, not the event horizon, not all we can hope for. We need to think in terms of a total, entirely redefining society, uh, trying to have a different society. The uh, interface, the uh, relation between the social and the state or the legal. So it's a legal demands that will perpetuate this order, uh, meaning that if it's in the law, it also uh, defines society. I'd love to have horizontal ways of uh, generating societies that do communities that don't have legal uh, representation because someone will always have to be excluded. And uh, my not being excluded because someone else will be excluded is not uh, satisfactory. Do we have anybody else? No microphone, no translation. I'm a little uh, disturbed by what you said, that school is uh, responsible, school is uh, to blame. I mean, you're my, you've always been my favorite, but you keep uh, talking about school, you keep saying uh, schools make uh, mistakes, uh, but uh, before uh, you go to school, you grew up in a family environment, so maybe you're uh, losing sight, maybe you've uh, forgotten about 10, 15 years, the 10-15 uh, years uh, where uh, an individual is shaped in a way by their parents, these cursed or doomed soldiers. I mean, I used to think that this was a military unit. I never realized that the guy who raped my uh, grandmother was a doomed or cursed uh, soldier. Um, I never realized uh, that, uh, so it's only for the school now, it's the job of the school. And no, you're entirely right, but Mm, I'm just uh, talking about things that apply to me directly. It's uh, that one's one directly. All these uh, social uh, forms, the media and the family, are functional with uh, respect to one another. But you can ask, what do we strike at? Where do we use um, leverage? But schools are important because they kind of they're an alternative to the family environment, and that they're a first attempt at socialization, first uh, socialized uh, space. And if in school uh, this type of fascist model is uh, implemented is uh, for me as uh, someone who believes in the power of education because I wouldn't work in the school system if I didn't believe in it uh, this is really painful but I believe in it because this uh, process of reproduction has a lot of apparatuses a state apparatus and ideological apparatus so that's in charge of putting it into practice I'm not saying I'm not pinning all the blame on schools but maybe it's just uh, me hoping that if we rethink schools they might change something but the schools would need to be free not just in terms of substance, and now I don't know if you're aware of this, but as I'll, I'll say it anyway, but uh, there's a slight uh, difference here for three and now four years in uh, secondary school, how many women are uh, spoken about in history class? How many women are um, 10? 
Bachelors of in History class specifically. No, it's not just one, but it's not ten either. Literally three, that's the answer. Uh, one of whom is a saint, uh, Saint Hedvig, uh, Jadwiga. And in the core curriculum, under in the former government, uh, there were also three women. Uh, instead of Helena Mojeska, uh we have Inka, who was a... Um, fighter in the post-war anti-communist resistance who was uh, tortured and killed by the communist authorities. So uh, it's based on competition rival rivalry and uh, the, there's no sense of community. And if you don't, uh, if you can't create a community, if there's no sense of being together uh, socially, and Magda uh, described this very well in practical terms, then you end up uh, susceptible to fascism. Thanks. Uh, and do we do we have anybody else from the audience? And so I have a question. I wanted. There's two things that uh, Piotr said that I wanted to uh, refer to. Uh, one concerns the school. I mean, of course, uh, parents and school, obviously, and parents and the uh, home environment uh, have a lot of influence. Uh, besides, the title of the session is has contains the word uh, feminism, so there are feminist uh, claims or statements based on analyses which say that the home environment should be a school of in fairness. Um, should teach fairness, but it doesn't because there's an unfair uh, division of uh, chores. And it's not. And uh, so it does lead to uh, inequality. And uh, there are um, public opinion polls uh, held this year that show that nothing has been uh, changed. So no equality, no uh, fair equality is uh, taught and promoted in a home environment. And this is inconsistent with uh, declarative equality because other studies show other studies by the uh, polling institute uh, show that there's increasing support for civil partnerships or actually for partnerships partnership in uh, marriage where everybody has uh, an equal share of chores but if we look uh, closer we see that nothing's changed in the last 50 years and in large on a large sample because uh, we could of course look at uh, excerpts and so one experience I have of the school environment is that I remember when I was the plenipotentiary for equal treatment and the government tried to introduce a program called Safe School and I attended the session, the meeting, and I began saying that in safety in school it didn't mean more CCTV. Uh, because that's what they actually wanted to bring down to. They said, I think that's a mistake, that's uh, you know, the misconception. It's not that the schools and teachers teach badly, but the whole system believes that it'll be safe if there's total surveillance and control. And uh, my, what I was saying, that more CCTVs uh, would uh, allow you to catch more people, but uh, you won't prevent anything. And I had a hard time getting my message across. So finally, they agreed to have uh, nonviolent conflict resolution, uh, equality, and so on as a part of the safe school program. But I saw, I looked in, looking at their faces, I saw that they did it uh, so as not to what, oppose me, so I wouldn't uh, be unhappy. I mean, they saw uh, me as a professor that uh, should be appeased in a way. But um, mm, the people who decide about the school system should realize that uh, this is what safety uh, means. And without that, you won't change anything. Of course, an individual teacher can make a difference. Now, I just wanted to refer to the part about uh, marriage and uh, civil partnerships, marriage, and uh, use rec resorting to the law. I have, I'm uh, ambiguous here because I have a background in uh, the law. 
uh, and I, as in liberal feminism, I always wanted to have uh, rights enshrined and written down. But I fully agree with Piotr, namely, that if we're thinking about a radical change, if we're moving from liberal feminism to radical feminism, if we're trying to reconstruct a world, uh, rebuild a world so that it's uh, governed by the principle of equality, here I'd refer to Marta Fineman, who in the 1990s, she's not very well known in Poland, in the 1990s she wrote, uh, quoting uh, US law, saying that marriages are unconstitutional. To it, uh, they privilege a temporary sexual union of two adults. And uh, for no good reason, just because this uh, relationship exists, it provides uh, privileges in uh, taxes, the right to uh, visit someone in hospital. Uh, given that so many uh, marriages uh, split up, uh, so many people don't uh, get married, so privileging one form of relationship, uh, being, be it heterosexual or homosexual, is runs counter to the principle of equality. She's uh, saying that the state should not be involved in that the state should look at caring relationships. Somebody, somebody uh, takes care, cares for uh, an elderly person, and uh, somebody, so the, the, these carers, caregivers, ought to be uh, supported by the state. Everything else that can be regulated in civil law. I know that this is, I mean, this is a uh, thesis, this is something that's still out there. Uh, it's still very revolutionary, but if we're talking about revolutionary um, solutions, I still think that uh, pouring uh, new wine in old legal bottles uh, will not uh, really uh, lead to change, or the change will be uh, superficial. And uh, let me give you an example that I, um, there was a radio interview with a Polish uh, opera director who said that he had to marry his partner because the partner was from uh, the uh, Basque country in Spain, and uh, friends were saying, how come you guys are together and you're not married? Uh, so if you use the same mindsets and you, uh, so and if you apply, then it was, that's what happens when it's regulated legally. Is this the change that we're trying for? Well, there's no easy solution. I agree that in today's world, in the, day, in the world today, it does give a lot of benefits, but maybe it's time to rethink the world, to think uh, of a new world. I asked uh, for the floor. I have a question to Marta Gavin. Uh, together with... Um, we were uh, blockading a uh, march by the all polish youth uh, and we were they said that we weren't women with uh, zuzanna herzberg uh, who's here and um they i suppose they meant it as uh, an insult i mean i said we could give uh, real life examples if anybody wants to uh, quote something that happened to them so i wonder how fascists see women and why they would have thought that it was offensive. It was, and does it have anything to do with the paradigm of the virgin whore, or the uh, holy whore? Sorry, um, I think it does because, I mean, based on texts uh, that are out there, and this is what's at stake. Uh, that's why I was uh, saying about. I, I told you about this moment when these young women began speaking about their sexuality, began uh, making their own demands, uh, began be, uh, they felt had a feeling of entitlement. And this was more revolutionary than any discussion about abortion. All appearances to the contrary, despite what one might expect. This uh, thing that you're not real women. So uh, it uh, invokes or calls up a form of femininity that has to do with subjugation on the one hand, but also desexualization and also um, so women are expected and I didn't really, uh, I didn't say this because it was pretty awful, but um, as part of this uh, struggle, because it's kind of symptomatic, and of this situation this between uh, men and women, the uh, men, the boys uh, finally said what women were for, and they made it very uh, clear, very plain, and they gave uh, details explicitly. So the women are there to uh, satisfy a man, 
And this uh, satisfaction uh, means that women don't have the right to get any gratification or satisfaction in this thing. So the holy whore, uh, holy in the sense that women uh, aren't entitled, they don't make claims, they don't make demands, they're um, subjugated and the whore because women serve to uh, satisfy men sexually, not uh, to take care of the house, not to give uh, birth, not to, but in both cases, women don't have an identity of their own. They don't, uh, they can't uh, occupy space under their own conditions as in they can't choose their own way of life, uh, uh, both verbally and in the way they speak, in the way the, that affects the way women are treated by men and by other women as well, because that also happens. So this is something that's like sustained. And uh, these uh, moments of rupture, so when uh, you or other people walk out, when they, uh, uh, it's not resistance, but affirmation, uh, self-affirmation, what women will want, I think that's the most uh, revolutionary move there is, but women should rethink their own identity to uh, occupy space or to um, more, but they'll have to uh, carve out that mm -hmm. space for themselves. Thanks, Susan uh, Hertzberg. I was thinking about this, uh, the situation that we were in, and I came to a different conclusion because this was uh, after the uh, demonstration was uh, uh, dissolved and the police left uh, both sides on Piłsudski Square. So all of us were in the same space, we were mingling. And when they started uh, chanting and we opposed them, they uh, looked us in the face and this was on the verge of violence. So uh, to start uh, this violence, uh, they needed to uh, step out of the white heteronormative patriarchy that they were taught in Polish school. So first they needed to say that we were not a part of them, their group, they're different. And so they needed to exclude us, but then they still have the thing that you're not supposed to uh, hit women. And if, um, and ultimately they would have resorted to uh, physical violence. So in order to hit us, they had to uh, tell themselves that we are not women, because then they would uh, themselves have uh, problems and uh, shouting to that uh, to our faces and trying to uh, take uh, the clothes of one of them, one of us, sorry, allowed them to uh, kind of reassure themselves that it's okay. Now I wanted to uh, comment, to refer to what you said, what Magda said. I understand the need for empowerment, for identity in a context, in the context of opposing violence, uh, gender-based violence, because I think we're dwelling on this. Uh, people who've lived as men are uh, prone to violence towards people who live as women. And I disagree, and I want to disagree because for me, the gender distinction in the context of what we're talking about this weekend, so what's between feminism and fascism, that's not a gender uh, perspective, it's not something for me, male um, gender identity or female gender identity, but more, it's, it's more of a question of the uh, uh, patriarchy that we're representing uh, via various uh, practices. And what I've been seeing the last few years, and uh, briefly, um, you mentioned uh, your personal experience. I just wanted to say, okay, we're talking about the situation in Lublin, and this was the first time for years that I gave it any thought. I think we want to act quickly. We want the change to happen like this. And I'm. Uh, this made me wonder, because 
was in 2011 when we were blocking the uh, march, uh, the, the um, extreme poli the march of the extreme patriots. Let's put it this way. So uh, it, there was uh, the, the, they are throwing rocks at us. I mean, it was 2011, and uh, it's, it's seven years on. It was obvious that they would be throwing rocks, and uh, the hundred uh, we were uh, there were a hundred of us. We tried to block, uh, and the, it was obvious that we wouldn't throw those rocks, uh, stones back, because we needed to uh, take a look after our image. We because all the media would try and say that it's a binary, uh, that these are fascists uh, versus Antifa, and that uh, they're uh, as uh, ones as bad as the other instead of um, society and the, that these are the fringes of society and this is something we're still dwelling on and I wonder why uh, what for because this uh, oppression this uh, violence uh, that is being represented by extreme right-wing movements is um, a violence that's uh, superficial I mean that's out there that it, that's external and I think that in our groups in our circles which are uh, relatively um, uh, and there's not very many of us I have to say that these mechanisms are represented in a similar way but they're even worse because they're hidden what I'm saying is that uh, we have manipulation we're trying to use uh, vocabulary that's more sensitive that's uh, inclusive and so on but uh, we still keep talking about gender distinctions we still keep saying that men are such and such towards uh, people who experienced life as women and what I've been asking myself for a number of years is uh, how feminine movements, uh, how feminist movements, uh, quote unquote, these uh, movements, these um, that we've been seeing in Poland uh, for the last few years, how they have uh, affected the way we think about ourselves, how we see ourselves, uh, how we respond to a situation, how we're trying to look for non-hierarchical methods of encountering and uh, talking. Uh, of course, here and now I can see this. Yes, we're all here on in, in a theater set. Uh, we're together as in a set where other, our relations were close, but uh, t -t 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 but this is a fairly uh, narrow, uh, specific group of people who are vocal, who are speaking out. I think we have a lot of groups uh, present here which are under uh, groups which are underrepresented. And after this uh, Co Future of Culture forum, I kind of think that we haven't done enough to bring in uh, those groups. We don't have people who are let's say who represent a neoliberal perspective we don't have politicians here who um, are uh, represent the government or uh, the parliament we don't have uh, workers who culture workers who aren't uh, creative workers and I think that for for me at least it would be far more important to uh, consider how we can change our narrative and not gender ourselves but think about caring feminism which means that we're uh, creating a long-term image of a uh, militant feminist who represents the patriarchal model actually and that's uh, pointless I think in fact, I couldn't agree more in a sense that what I was saying actually was based on the background that we have this school-based situation where there are certain paradigms. So the figure of masculinity and femininity is just abused, it's taken advantage of, and I agree with you 100%. Yes, we have to go deep. And when I think about empowerment, I did use empowerment of women, but I meant empowerment in spite of, well, just the term, the word empowerment, it could be a bit fascist, have some fascist connotations, right? Because you can imagine empowerment that will be an identity construct that will be very um, excluding, yes, it would be prone to exclusion, but to using exclusion. But think about late Foucault context where empowerment is like self-improvement. It's self-improvement, the work you do to try to clash like or face up to your surroundings, the environment, look for your freedom path, this 
channels of relief, so to speak. And this could be what happens to you. It could be the figure of masculinity or femininity. That's very important to process this uh, God's mother, the Holy Mary, the sacred whore, the male soldier, etc. And not stop here. Yeah, we should not stop there. Absolutely not. If we stop, this would just be another reconfigured, yes, but also oppression structures, yeah, or the structure of oppression once again. If I can comment that we don't have anyone who would represent the parliamentary slash neoliberal at 5 p.m., we'll have a debate with a few such representatives present, so join us. I have a comment to your interventions. Maybe we are too fast in this change process. Speaking about Lublin example, well, paradoxically, we should not say that oppression is always um, typical of radical right. I know it from experience. When I was getting ready for the march, we spoke to the head of Lublin ONR, this right-wing organization. This guy, he spoke to us openly. Uh, there was nothing nasty he would do to us. And he reassured us that from their side, there would be no harm done. And to the best you know, my knowledge, they kept the promise. Oh, and our organization was not involved in throwing slabs and blocks and stones. So that's our story. My voice would be against the current a little bit, because let me start by saying that the issue of violence, and I don't remember what your name was, Aga. Okay. Well, my point is that the ability to be oppressive and to use violence, it's a part of being human. Anthropologically, yes. On the one hand, a claim not to use violence, it does not negate the fact that ability to be violent, I mean, it can't be negated, it can't be eradicated. So the problem on our side could be more like we don't know, because the violence is there anyway, yes? Because oppression is always present in a power relationship. It can be different at times. You can't see that every power relationship has the same potential of oppression. Not at all, but I mean, also the oppression can be of different quality and intensity, but we should really think twice and we should like include that let's consider how this oppression which will be there anyway um for example it'll be there because of the way we react to those ideas that we disagree with and those who spread those ideas people yeah who spread those ideas and also how we respond to oppression because of the power mechanism. So the issue of oppression or violence should not just be boiling down to like, there is violence, let's eradicate it. No, quite to the contrary. Let's think what we can do to make sure that this oppression and violence is paradoxically useful. To what extent we can, you know, either with Foucault strategies or self-improvement, strategies, how to make sure we are aware of our ability to do harm, to use violence and to be oppressive. And then we will, when we refrain ourselves from violence, we know why we do it and we know in what conditions we could actually use violence. Now, talking about the change capacity, I've been thinking sometimes change is born within. It's because of what we do internally. Some change is externally triggered, yeah? Fascism, it's about economics, about culture. So the question is, how can we make use of these external situations in the world? How can you use them to try to change these dominant cultural and political structures to our benefit? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we have the five minutes, just five last minutes, so madam, you 
wanted to speak. Yes, I have a very specific intervention. I've been cooperating with Robert Biedron. We were touring Poland over the last 18 months, quite a lot. Let me tell you about an event during our road show in Elk. It was a promotion by, of a book. Five, yes, five bold Nazi uh, hooligans came. That's how we called them. We didn't know which Nazi organization they present. They sat in the last row. They were there, all quiet, all peaceful. We didn't know what they were planning to do, even though they had some uh, stuff in their hands. But aggression really started on our side. Our side was 99% of the room. And some people stood up in the first row. They approached me as the facilitator. And they said, call the police or tell these people to get out of here. Even though these bold guys hadn't done anything, they hadn't said anything at that point. And then Robert Biedron decided to somehow put a stop to aggression from our side. And he addressed these guys. And he started explaining to these who wanted to get rid of them. He said, why they are the way they are, that they have some fears, anxieties. Maybe they came here to talk about their anger. And one of them said, but we're not afraid of anything. And then Robert says, you're not afraid? OK, let's get a selfie then. And these guys actually stood up. They got a selfie with Robert. It was such an unexpected turn of events, they were like overwhelmed, and after a few minutes they just stood up and left tacitly. And at the end of the day, they were sitting in the next uh, beer garden and they just waved us goodbye when we were leaving. So why do I say that? Well, I don't say that to, to tell you that that's the way you should act during the march, the parade, when there is a group, pre-planned, um, strong aggression. But perhaps sometimes we are not open-minded enough. Perhaps we are encapsulated in our little bubbles and that spurs the aggression. And this aggression inside us, it's concealed, it's hidden. OK, uh, but we need to conclude quite soon. Piotr, you wanted to comment, and I want to comment as well. So here it is. We spoke about hostility against LGBTQ community and the so-called features that are perceived as feminine. But what does it have in common? Why do fascists, why are they so afraid of not homosexuality anymore? It was the only thing of LGBTQ with the belight, but why are they so afraid of any manifestation of a desire different from the structured one. And since the title of the panel is From the Agnostics to Resistance, I'm wondering now if you want to resist, perhaps both women and LGBTQ communities could openly express their sexuality. If they just spoke up about their sexuality, if that is precisely what the others are afraid of. I don't want to scare you guys, okay? But maybe that's what we need. No? No? Uh, well, it looks like that was the final intervention because all the other participants had given up. So thank you very much. Our time is running out this very moment. So join us later on behind the scenes. Thank you.